Okay, hi guys and welcome to today's show. Today I'm going to be doing a video I've been promising for a hell of a long time and I thought why not do it today and that is a beginner's guide to buying your first timepiece. Now before we get into this particular video, I've got to do my customary wristwatch check and it's, it's a bright one today but this of course is my little SKX and I've put it on this neon yellow uh, strap. This is from Red Roosters in the UK. Uh, I actually did a video about it last summer. It's a great summer strap, perfect for the summer, nice and bright, lively. It is a 20 millimeter size. I bought it so I could put it on my Squirely 1521 as well. So yeah, unfortunately not from Roost County Watch Club, but I hope they will consider doing some more summery summary more summer colors like this it is really really fun so yeah wristwatch check done now let's roll the intro and get into today's video So, buying your first timepiece. Now, bear in mind there are two ways of going about this. You can obviously buy brand new or you can buy a used timepiece. Now, if this is your first timepiece, I really recommend you buy it from new. You're just not going to have the same risks involved. You're not going to have to worry about its authenticity, all the rest of it. Also, you're going to be covered by the warranty. Leave the buying used more to the kind of uh, when you've gathered a little bit more experience and you've started watch collecting uh, for further down the line for expanding into a watch collection which it will happen because rest assured there is no perfect one watch that's why we start collecting you there are so many unique different uses and looks and designs it can really get addictive but it's one of the best hobbies um, a gentleman can have and women as well and trust me before you know it, if you watch my channel uh, you will be a seasoned watch aficionado uh, before you can uh, before you know it okay so we'll start right at the beginning and that is of course budget it's probably the most personal aspect of buying your first watch now watches of course can start from fifty dollars you can get a really cool decent first watch for fifty dollars all the way to a million dollars i mean really high-end super horology stuff but basically, in the mainstream, there are kind of three levels. Uh, we'll forget the high-end Hort Horology Billionaire Boys Club style of watch for, for the moment. We'll stick to what most of us mere mortals are used to. So there's entry level, which I'd say is from about $50 to $500 thereabouts. Then there's the mid-range, which ranges, and this, this varies from person to person. This, you might disagree with this, but this is generally from my experience of collecting over the years. So the mid-range, we're talking 500 to about 1,500 to 2,000. And then above the 2,000, 1,000 and a half dollar mark, we're entering into the luxury range. So there's those three, you know, entry, middle, and of course, luxury. Once you've figured out your budget, then you can kind of see what kind of brands you can get. Uh, your budget will determine the origin of the watch. Most of the entry level pieces of really outstanding quality and robustness, I would say, are Japanese. They definitely dominate the entry level. Uh, then the mid and luxury range, you're looking at German timepieces and predominantly the Swiss as well. Those are the three countries to me. Of course, there's watchmakers from all over the world, but those are the three big players in the game. If you're starting off, I'd start with Japanese make like Seiko, uh, Citizen, that kind of thing. They offer amazing high quality uh, watches for very, very low. But having said that, you can get a, a fantastic Swiss made Swatch for 50 bucks that is equally as tastefully done and robust and very collectible and fun as well. So the second thing you have to consider is how is the watch powered? 
there's basically two main camps to this. There's quartz and then there's mechanical. Mechanical is that traditional watchmaking that goes back hundreds of years. We're talking the escapements and gears and what you envisage when you think of traditional watchmaking. It's all mainly powered by a balance spring. You know, there's two main camps here. There's manual wind, which, you know, you turn the, the crown and physically top up every day. And of course there's automatic, which is powered by the rotor that spins in the back, like this piece right here. This is an automatic piece. And then of course there's quartz, which is battery operated. Quartz refers to the little quartz crystals inside the integrated circuits. They're not necessarily always battery powered. Some of them are solar, like the fantastic uh, Citizen Eco drives, for example, which are, are really great. Quartz, of course, is the most accurate. For me personally, I do prefer mechanical timepieces, especially automatics. It just has that romance, that tradition going back hundreds and hundreds of years to the early days of, of, of timekeeping. Don't get me wrong, quartz has its use. If you're looking for something very robust and accurate and you don't wanna worry about it, then go quartz. But there is a, something magical, that biomechanical relationship with the automatic timepiece, that little beating, ticking machine that is almost like a heart. Uh, that you wear on your wrist. It's something quite special. To be honest, it's what got me to fall in love with this passion of watch collecting in the first place. Okay, so the third thing you have to consider is the type of watch you're going to go for. Field watches, pocket watches, dress watches, uh, digital watches, which obviously have that digital display and not an any digi watches, which are uh, a combination of the two, which have digital and the traditional, you know, analog three hands, uh, etc. There's diving watches, which is one of my favorite, which really make for excellent everyday watches. Aviation watches, which are traditionally a bit bigger because, you know, back in the day, pilots wore goggles, uh, so they had to be legible. Racing watches, we think of the Daytona, we think of the, the Speedmaster before it went to the moon, obviously. The type of watch is important, and it's great because you can really kind of reflect your personality. They're built for tasks. Uh, you can have different watches for different occasions. They really drive the design. For example, dress watches are supposed to be thinner, more formal, more elegant, and they're not so robust, designed to slip under the cuff when you wear a suit. Diving watches, as we mentioned, uh, are probably my favorite because they're built to be robust, water resistant, to, to go to deeper depths. In, uh, in the ocean, obviously. They're extremely legible because they were designed to be read underwater. They have that timing bezel, which you can actually use, you know, if you're cooking a pizza or, or something like that, you can actually use them in quite a normal domestic setting. You don't have to go diving. And that brings me on into the fourth point, and that is the complication. Now, the complication in watch jargon, basically a word for describing the features. So, for example, a complication like this says, SKX has the date and the day. So the complication is a day date. Another one could be a GMT. A GMT is an extra hand which shows a separate time zone. GMT obviously standing for Greenwich Mean Time. Things like tourbillon, very kind of esoteric high-end complications that are extremely expensive uh, but very beautiful. These are more towards horterology, the super high-end luxury timepieces because these are incredibly difficult to make. There's obviously chronographs. So these are one of my favorite complications used for timing. There are moon phases, which is one of the oldest. Probably a, a complication you'll never actually need, but incredibly elegant. There are perpetual calendars, which are, well, self-explanatory. There are triple dates. Uh, but what's great about complications is that you can really find a watch that is useful to you. For example, if you're a pilot, you look at the Rolex GMT, the complication there with the, the, the GMT hand is perfect for a traveler that, that changes time zone constantly and wants to always have, for example, I have a GMT, I check the time in London where I'm originally from, then I have the main time set to local time, which of course is New York where I'm filming this right now. Especially when you want to phone your family, you don't want to wake them up in the middle of the night, that kind of thing. Again, they kind of determine the, the aesthetic and style of the watch. Some complications, especially mechanical chronographs are a good example. They're very complicated to make and that kind of pushes up the price. If you want to keep costs down, go with quartz. Now my fifth and last point is 
the components of the watch. So you always want to consider what the case is actually made out of. Uh, most watches typically are stainless steel. There is of course titanium, which is a lighter metal. So if you want something very comfortable and sporty, go for titanium. If you're going high-end and dressy, you might want to gravitate towards precious metals, gold, yellow gold, platinum, you know, really expensive. Obviously that's going to push the price up, but bear in mind, precious metals are not as robust as stainless steel. So always think about the case, its shape, its design, uh, and what it's made out of. The other components obviously are the strap or bracelets. Traditionally watches were always worn, uh, firstly they were always worn on leather straps and then kind of bracelets came in. Mesh is very very good for summer. Uh, they can really change how a watch is worn. You got uh, straps like the famous NATO straps which were developed by the British military in the 1960s. This is a NATO strap for example. They are extremely good because they attach both spring bars on both sides so if one fails the watch is still attached to you. So they were designed for the military uh, because their lives depended on these things. They're water resistant, you know, you can get them wet, you can go swimming. You don't want to wear a, a leather strap or an ex extremely expensive leather strap in the summer because the oils in your skin will muck it up, etc, etc. So again, you want to think about the strap you're going for. You can always change this. Some watches have integrated lugs. Uh, and you can't change them, so always look out for that. Rubber straps are another one. Uh, they are excellent for swimming, extremely good for hot, humid climate, summertime, that kind of thing. Also worth a mention is pearl on straps. I've done countless videos discussing and showing all the best different kind of straps and combinations. You can really bring an extra uh, level of enjoyment, dress up a watch, dress it down, uh, make it even more comfortable, make it even more versatile and really express yourself. So it's a really fun thing to do, but also worthy to consider the components of the watch. So that's pretty much it. Those are the bare, simple basics, but from there, you'll really get a grasp of what's out there. I totally recommend uh, shopping online, always do your research. If you have your own tips, please do share them down below uh, what to look out for when buying your first watch. I have one of the most uh, knowledgeable experienced and intelligent uh, audiences out there on YouTube without a doubt. The wealth of experience between us is undeniable so please guys share your your bits of advice down below. But that's pretty much the basics. Obviously there's a ton more to learn. I'm still learning every single day. It never stops but it's such a rewarding uh, and fun hobby. Please don't forget to check out my channel. There's lots of videos with tons of advice, buying everything from entry all the way to luxury timepieces, used, new, all the rest of it. Thank you guys very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. It really does help me, so please don't forget to hit that like button. And as always guys, I'll catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.